Welcome back to the Lime Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander, and this is a place that we bring together the world's leading experts on all things health and wellness to help you optimize your mind, body, and movement. Today's conversation is all about human sexuality, tantra, uh, trauma, uh, healing said trauma to open oneself up to deeper intimacy within relationship and connection with one's self and their partner or partners, depending upon your relationship container. We get into all that in this conversation and uh, is with my dear friend, Layla Martin. I have known and loved Layla for the last, I think, I feel like maybe five, five years, six years, something like that, seven years. Uh, she's beautiful, she's sweet, she's passionate, she's intelligent, and you guys are gonna get a kick out of this conversation. Layla studied human biology and sexuality at Stanford University. She lived in Tibet and in India for something like 10 years and studied Tantra. She is a world-renowned expert on all things human sexuality and I'm so grateful to get to share her wisdom with you guys today. I want to thank you guys for leaving us reviews on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. I want to read one from Sista Marley. It says episode 437. Thank you for introducing us to Blue. A very inspiring chat. Thank you guys for leaving us reviews. Uh, thank you for subscribing so you get each week's episode. Thank you for sharing. Thanks for doing you. Let's get to it with my very good friend Layla Martin. Thank you for uh, being you. Thank you for your journey. Yeah, I really love you. I love you too. Yeah, I feel that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to start with uh, with by asking something that's typically you're supposed to like build rapport and connection, all that stuff. Um, but I want to get just like right into a thing. Something that is, I hear that I could hear some demographic of people rolling their eyes, and some dem- demographic of people being like, "Oh, that's amazing." A term like sex magic. Mm sex magic like mm. what the hell is sex magic so sex magic all right here here's the like the truthiest of truths like people right, roll their eyes because we every human on earth started out with what we would call magical practices as part of their tribal experience yeah. all of us came of age like if you go far enough back into any of our ancestry where we connected to energy where we knew there was consciousness in everything in the plants in the animals in our own bodies and where we worked with the forces of nature to amplify and activate our experience as co-creators of reality and in specifically european and uh the near eastern cultures this got decimated and crushed with the rise of patriarchal religions and so all of a sudden what was so normal and natural to us being connected to energy uh, being connected to magic which is really just working with energy to amplify what you desire to amplify your prayers to amplify your intentions to amplify your sexual experience to amplify your connection to nature that became demonic, weird, wrong, and in many places punishable by death. Then what happened in the enlightenment, because, you know, a lot of people who got really obsessed with religion went and lost their minds and did really irrational, really violent things. So in the enlightenment in Europe, science became the opposite of religion. And so people who love science are people who are, you know, now we think into rationality, into, you know, thinking clearly, into doing things in a way that orders our world in a way that makes sense. And religion is the opposite. But what we forget is that mysticism and energy is not religion. So you can be super scientific, super rational. I went to Stanford University. I love me some good science and rational thought. And you can also be mystical. You can be swept away by the beauty and energy of nature, by the arrows of the most powerful orgasm. And we've lost that as a society. So oftentimes people who think of themselves as scientific, as rational, will roll their eyes at the idea of something like sex magic. But what we don't realize is that sex Sex magic is this essential essence of who we are as humans, people of all genders. And what you can do in a practice like sex magic is use the power of your erotic energy through your entire body to amplify your intentions, to amplify your manifestations. And it actually blows my mind how effective of a practice it is, how much it works. Hmm. Um, what is sexual energy, Layla? And how can we... Like, what does that mean? What is it when I say, what is sexual energy? What are the uses? What are the confusions? What do we think we know about it? What could we learn more about it and feel more about it? Why does it matter? So if you think about it, we all perceive energy, even if we're not super sensitive to energy moving through our bodies. Like we all know 
someone with bad vibes, right? Like I think everyone could say like, if there was someone in the room in pitch black dark who had like really ill will towards me, could I feel it, yeah. right? Or could you feel the love from your lover across the bed, even if it was pitch black, right? We have this innate sense to pick up on energy, but because we've been so repressed as a culture, we've actually been taught to fear energy moving through our bodies, especially in European civilization, but then that spread all over the world. And that repression was to keep us from remembering our sovereign power. Because when, when you feel the energy in your own body, you know your own magnificence and power. And energy moving through your body is actually a conduit to remembering your own spiritual truth, your own divinity. And so sometimes people take it as this mark of pride, like, oh, I don't feel energy or that's super woo-woo. But actually being in touch with your energy body is one of the most personally empowering things that you can do. And recognizing that that got taken away from us systematically to disempower us is so important. So we stop rolling our eyes at the concept of energy and actually realize that the reclamation and sensitivity to it, regardless of your gender, is part of you remembering your own magnificence, your own activation, because energy is power. And so when you allow your energy body to get bigger, Bigger and bigger and more activated and you start to feel it, you amplify your power in every domain of your life. Mm -hmm. And so there's different flavors of energy, right? There's just pure life force energy. You could think of this as like chi, prana, bio energy. There's heart energy, right? Like we can all feel like the energy of the heart. There's deep creative energy, deep mental energy. There's sexual energy. So sexual energy is basically the flow of energy that comes from eros, that comes from attraction, that comes from magnetism, that comes from the urge to fuck and unify and make love. And that energy in the Taoist and Tantric teachings has a specific ability to be utilized in the body as any type of energy. It's basically like sexual energy can be transmuted into any other type of energy. So when you make love, you can actually push out your sexual energy. You can lose your sexual energy, or you can learn to channel it through your body in such a way that it becomes this source of fuel for either having the most outrageous sex and orgasms or doing your best creative genius work, activating your heart in whole new ways. So this sec like sexual energy both gives you access to the most incredible sex, and it also unlocks deeper resources of power within you. Mm. So your background, I'm gonna summate the best that I can in the shortest amount of time that I can, and then you can fill in all the blanks, and I hope I'm, I'm vaguely correct with some of the things. You studied in Stanford, you went to, uh, you went to Tibet and India and perhaps some other places in Asia for something like 10 years and studied Tantra and probably a bunch of other stuff. Uh, you experienced sexual abuse as a child at age nine. You were, had fear of, of turning into a woman and like repression and like, like, what will that mean? And you wanted to kind of stuff that down. You would, your nervous system would freeze down at the idea or the, the action of kissing a boy. Um, I think I mentioned you were raised Catholic. Maybe I didn't mention that yet. And you made this journey into yourself. And so some of the things that you're describing now, I'd imagine there was a point in your life where you too would find those to be woo-woo out there, not interested, keep that shit away from me. So for more, maybe not, but so, so please fill in all that. If I misspoke, I apologize. Um, but, but what I'm thinking is like for a person that hears things like energy and things like sexual energy and things like transmutation and all these words that they're, they're just like, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. I'm so disconnected from this. How do we bridge that gap? And did I explain any of that correctly? Your, your background, can you share your background? And then also for a person that is, I don't know what the hell we're talking about with energy and, and all the things like, how do we bridge that gap to two lanes? You pretty much nailed my background. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. I was going out on the limb there. I was like, oh boy, this is going to be disrespectful. You've been paying attention all these yeah. years. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. So for me, my body and my sexuality were more what I was afraid of. Mm -hmm. I've always been... Uh, out there in terms of being hungry to learn about energy and magical things, even if in my childhood religion that was wrong, like you burned in hell for reading tarot cards, for yeah. practicing sex magic, for daring to feel your own energy. And I just want to emphasize again, it's really important for us 
to to understand what happened in our repression and denial of energy because in the enlightenment in europe right there had been a few thousand years of people saying that religion was the reason why they were oppressing people making us all have no fun uh being you know super like you know sexuality outside of marriage will send you to hell witch burning right there was this outrageous um irrationality and danger from people who were wrapped up in religion. And so when the enlightenment happened and people started getting back into reason and principle and logic and science, there was this like, oh, we are free of this deep, dark oppression that has been holding humanity back for a few thousand years. But what happened was they didn't realize that what religion did was it actually, especially religion in Europe and the Near East, and then it became a global phenomenon was it had a deep intention to strip people of their primordial spiritual and mystical connection. So people have now associated religion with mysticism. And religion in some way, shape, or form for many people can be a disempowering tool if you think of it as someone else has to tell me who and what God is. Someone else has to tell me whether I'm even worthy of God. Like it's one of the greatest lies we've ever been told that you have to somehow deserve what you are. And so we've conflated now as a society, uh, religion and mysticism, thinking that religion is disempowering, but actually going all the way back to the roots of us as human beings, every single one of us comes from an ancestry of mystical practices that were in touch with energy, that were in touch with the consciousness of nature, that were in touch with uh, sexual power and liberation beyond all of our religious conditioning. So what I'm really passionate about is people realizing that you can be super scientific, right? You can be super into the nervous system. You can be super rationality and actually to reclaim mysticism, a connection to energy, a connection to sexual energy is to reclaim your own sovereign power and remembrance that there's something about our personal power that gets unlocked when we reconnect to this ancient way of being connected to all things, our bodies and our sexuality. Like, can you imagine how we can fuck if we get rid of all the conditioning that told us that it was shameful and wrong and bad and we let ourselves consensually and with respect for other humans be free again? It's it's amazing what's inside of us that we don't even realize because we've gotten two-dimensionally compressed against the idea of our own energy body. And yet our energy body is so incredibly important uh, for our liberation. And to your question, I didn't feel energy until I was about 18 years old because I went to Asia. I started studying tantric practices. I started studying Taoist practices. I started feeling sexual energy because I got a hold of this book, The Tao of Health, Sex, and Longevity. And it taught you how to do solo cultivation practices, basically masturbation, where you would feel your own sexual energy, your own turn on. So I had this little hut by the beach and I would literally lock myself in it and I'd read the practices out of the book and I would masturbate literally for like hours on end. And instead of just feeling pleasure build, pleasure build, pleasure build, and then climax, right? And I do this because it's like a a lot of us, um, I'll speak for women for sure, it's like as we're masturbating or as we're having sex, we're actually tensing our bodies. And so climax feels like a release. But when you release that way, you're actually pushing the sexual energy out of your body rather than pulling it up and in. So as I was training myself, it was like as I would touch myself and feel more and more pleasure, I would relax into the pleasure and then start to feel that pleasure can move. Like we all intuitively know what it feels like when you're like in love with someone and you're getting like movement in your belly or when you're really turned on by someone there's like a gravity like you can feel yourself like moving towards them right there's a there's a movement of the energy when you have a really good orgasm it spreads through your whole body and so pleasure can move and to really tap into sexual energy you start to feel the movement of your own pleasure and feel that it actually isn't restricted by the physiology of your body it can move through your entire body so as I was do that, doing that, just like masturbating and masturbating and being like, whoa, I could start to get the energy to move into different in different places and it would like boom, explode into my brain. And I was higher than any drug I'd taken. And I, by then I had been to Ibiza, like I'd taken all the MDMA and all that. And I was like, whoa, our sexual energy is actually one of the most powerful forces in the universe and it can get us endogenously high. Like how, how do we not all know about this? Mm. 
what's the training wheels like starting point for a man or a woman to start to explore that should you fly to haiti lock yourself into a cabin and me begin a a, uh, extended wanking practice (laughs) <laughs> luckily that's not I'm, the only if way I'm, I'm at my apartment in austin like where do i start as a guy if a gal she's in cincinnati you know she just wants to kind of kind of dip her feet in the water Ide- ideally <laughs> ideally the huts in haiti are run by some sort of like charismatic but seriously creepy like tantric guru you I know like that that's a, i like that fantasy we need to get into that as well you know yeah. 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 How do we dip ourselves into the water here? Just starting to feel like the engine hasn't been on. You know, the alternator just has been off for a long time. How do we start to feel enough of a spark to turn that into an ember that could potentially turn into a fire throughout our lives? Yes. So most of us masturbate and have sex in very habitual ways. So we literally turn off uh, the parts of our brain that seek true novelty and are in expanded states of consciousness. And many of us go into just habit. We're doing the same thing over and over again, especially when we masturbate. And oftentimes we'll use the same fantasies or if we're looking at porn, it's like you're actually in a very habituated um, default mode network area of your brain where you're just like pushing button and running the same tape over and over again. Also maybe using... Um, almost like exploiting sexual practice for something that's more of like an avoidant compulsive behavior. Yes. Yes. Perhaps as well. Or if you're having sex and you're super in either in your head through fantasy or like, Oh, do I look good? Does he love me? Mm-hmm. Or you're using sex as like kind of a go at gratification. Like you give me worth, right. Or I give you status or whatever it is. It's like, we're actually checking out of the power of sex, like the actual, moment that's here and we're missing out on this whole universe you can think of it the same way as meditation you could sit in a chair your whole life and never once touch the center of the power within you it's not until you meditate that you're like holy shit like that's been in there the whole time Mm -hmm. it's the same with sex you could do the equivalent of sitting in the chair your whole life and never once touch the depth of the sexual power within you and what's actually available to us Mm -hmm. and so just like the difference between sitting and meditation is having a practice and usually having like a set time where you're like, yo, I'm not just sitting around I'm meditating mm-hmm. makes all the difference. It's the same with sexuality. So mm-hmm. I really encourage that people pick up what I call a pleasure practice where it's like, even if it's 10 minutes once a week, even if it's 20 minutes once a week and you can do it more than that, you're setting aside time to do two things. One, engage with actual practices. So the same as with meditation, you know, slowing everything down, having awareness, maybe paying attention to your breath, whatever tools and techniques you use shift you out of just sitting into this other realm. It's the same thing with sexual practices. So you can use conscious breath work. You can use the way that you actually move your pelvis or use your pelvic floor. You can start to become more sensitive to energy the same way if you meditate long enough, you're going to start feeling energy. You'll feel the same thing in a pleasure practice over time. And you give yourself intentional space, right? Like when you're meditating, you're like, I don't have to feel a certain way. Like meditation is actually the time where I let whatever is here be here and I remain present with it. Whereas you go about the rest of your life usually trying to control things. But in meditation, it's like, yo, the thoughts just come, the feelings just come, and I'm just present. In a pleasure practice with sexuality, it's the same thing. So for most of us, we've actually been trying to control our sexuality our entire lives. So you go to masturbate and it's like, I'm moving towards climax, right? For people of all genders, that's usually what we're trying to do when we're masturbating and usually kind of as fast as possible. Same when we're making love, right? We usually have or or having sex. We usually have like a set thing of goals, right? I want her to have this many climaxes. I want him to definitely have a heart on the entire time. I want to be fucking awesome, right? It's this list of goals that we have, understandably. So in a pleasure practice, you take those goals out. And just like meditation, you're like, actually, what's here? And what could sex be like if I just showed up for what was here rather than always trying to push it towards some outcome? And when you do that, sex actually starts to feel, for many of you who've probably tried breathwork, sex starts to feel more like a breathwork journey where it gets 
deeply sensational. There's this like delicious loss of control. It's much richer, the realm that you're inhabiting. And for sex, like that's just the starting point. So you give yourself the time and space to do pleasure practices, and then you start adding in basic tools that will start to unlock your sexuality. And if you're like, that feels so foreign, I'm sure before you ever meditated or did breath work, you were like, wow, that sounds crazy. Or an ice bath. And then you do it and you're like, holy shit, this is so not only natural and normal, it makes this such a huge difference in my life. Sacred sexuality practices is it's this exact same way. It seems like a there's a quote, something like this. I don't know what it is exactly. This isn't even close to the quote, but it's like we live in a shanty inside of our minds and we don't realize that there's like an, we have keys to this entire mansion within the rest of our body. Yes. And we're just worshiped, we're just in the shanty. And we have this the story that it's have you ever heard of uh the the Plato Cave? Yeah. story you know or like the, the, there's these i think it's four fellas they're inside of a cave and they were they're shackled into this cave and there's a fire outside of the cave and there's a pathway that goes past the fire and all they see their entire life is these shadows against the wall yeah. they start to believe that that's the entirety of life and then one of the individuals breaks free of the shackles and then they go out in the world and first it's like oh it's like too bright and it's scary and it's like three dimensionality it's like oh it's like too much yeah and he sees himself in the reflection and that's like that's that kind of eases him into the experience and then he finally opens up he like wakes up mm. and then he goes back into the cave and he tries to share like oh my god guys like there's a whole world out there like it's not just this dark two-dimensional shanty reality that we've lived in and then they end up being like no you're fucking insane and they i think they kill him in the story um you know so sorry about that that's you know, <laughs> <laughs> Wish there was a better ending, <laughs> but I feel like that's something that's happening with a lot of people. We're all kind of doing our own version of of Plato's cave, you know, and and and, and that belief that okay, if you're living in a, a goal driven mindset within sexuality, then you're probably stuck in your head because that's what the prefrontal cortex and all that you know all that like like forebrain stuff does. Yes, it's like let's get there. Yes, you know, but if you allow yourself the spaciousness to trust your body which perhaps at some point in your life you learned that that's, it's unsafe to do so, suddenly this whole new story starts to unwind and you start to be able to um, be taken in a way. And your body, you tap into this intelligence. And yeah. if you haven't had even like a little semblance of experience with that, it would sound crazy. It's like sharing somebody like, you know, doing psilocybin or something like that. There's just no way to describe it. Yeah. But everybody has access to tapping into the wisdom of the body. It's just, and we have these tools, we have breath work, we have sacred sexuality, we have things of the sort. But I think it's just getting like the foot in the door of, of experiencing the body and trusting it's safe to experience the body and perhaps even realizing that you haven't uh, realized that you don't trust your body. Yes. You know? Yes. So how does a person start to maybe bridge that, that gap? You mentioned breath work could be a good tool. I think the way that we did it where you were kind of adding in almost this like sensuality sexuality to it like that was very cool like allowing yourself to be audible mm, with it it's mm. it like it turns the gears and then it's like oh here we are yeah yeah well sounding is actually very important it's it's important for men and women um so sounding is a really important tool for women it not only tones the vagus nerve but it like puts you into much more of a surrendered flow state mm. as you're expressing for men some version of learning to sound actually helps them move sexual energy from your cock all the way up through your body, which is a huge part of the practice to be able to control and delay ejaculation, but also to be able to have full body orgasms. And the thing is, you don't have to sound when you're making love if you don't want to. But if you do it in your solo practice, the sounding actually retrains the movement of energy through your body mm -hmm. and helps train you to relax into your pleasure rather than tighten around your pleasure. So the more we tighten around our pleasure, the more our body will start to upper limit and say, okay, you got to come or you have to climax. Like I can only tolerate so much pleasure. When you do something like breath work or sounding and you have a pleasure practice over time, you actually build your nervous system's capacity to feel more and more and more pleasure before you have to push it out. Mm -hmm. And as you know, to, to your question, one thing that's really important is to understand why are we so afraid of the body? Yeah. Why are we so afraid of that level of intimacy? And one of the things that I really looked at when 
um, I, I was a practicing tantric still am. Um, but for 10 years, I was more of the Eastern lineage. Like I, you know, come from transmitted lineage. I, you know, listen to gurus. I do all these very contained practices, right? The tantric lineage is just, oh, it's so filled with these incredibly powerful practices that have been uh, maintained and, and transmitted through, um, in my case, the Indian lineage, but you can also find it in Tibet and Bhutan and other places in Asia. And there there was a, a strictness to it, right? It's also a lineage that's been very taken over by and transmitted by men for a really long period of time. And I never identified as a witch before. I was like, those bitches don't have lineage. Like they're doing crazy shit out in nature. I have no idea what that is. Mm. And I started doing sex magic, this practice where you use your, your erotic energy, your sexual turn on, and you actually move it through all the different chakras of your body. And when you get up to your crown chakra, right at the top of your head, as you come into a state of peak pleasure or orgasm, you actually visualize what it is that you want. Mm. And what's so powerful about it, right? Like we all are into manifestation or intentionality in some way, shape or form, but we're engaging our prefrontal cortex because most of the time when we do affirmations or intentions, we do them verbally. So we're saying to my, ourselves, this is what I want. This is what I want to have. We're writing it down. We're speaking it. This is engaging the weakest part of our nervous system. If you want to align on a deep deep intention or manifestation, it's so important to not just have the most superficial part of your brain turned on, but your actually your, your entire nervous system, including your unconscious and subconscious, which is usually where the resistance to having what you want lies. And so when you do a practice like sex magic, you are bringing your whole body online so that your entire nervous system is listening when you make your intention. You're no longer just doing it verbally. You're actually doing, it's like you're seeding the manifestation manifestation as your entire body is this entire, it's, it's like a receiver system listening to what it is that you're intending. Then you're also combining a peak state of pleasure with what you desire. So oftentimes when we don't go for what we want, it's because we've actually had it associated with pain or something bad when we were young. Like I don't go for money because I'm actually afraid of being that powerful, like having that much freedom. Or I don't go for the deepest relationship of partnership because I'm actually terrified of being rejected in love or heartbreak, right? So we've actually associated pain and fear with what we say we want. I won't let myself be healthy because I am scared of having that much life force energy. Right. Don't, or don't feel like you deserve it, I think. Like yeah. sh shame, like the core root, like there's a knot of shame in, I would imagine, a lot of people, but me. Like I've, I've, I'm in witness of that. Yeah. And yeah. so then it's like, as I become healthy, maybe what my nervous system is starting to feel is shame and that prevents me from making more healthy choices. Mm -hmm. So in sex magic, like let's say that you are actually doing a visualization of health, right? So you would actually get very clear on what does being healthy look like? Like, what would I do? What practices? All of that. What is the outcome of healthy look and feel like for me? So at the moment of peak pleasure or orgasm, you visualize that state of health. And what you're doing is you're actually sealing in your nervous system that health is no longer this path of like uncovering the root knot of shame or unworthiness, but it's now associated with the highest pleasure my body can experience. And that actually retrains your uh, deep nervous system. You can think of it as your unconscious mind to start to seek health in your environment because now it's coded as positive or beautiful. You can do that practice many times. So that's what makes sex magic such a powerful manifestation. You're combining pleasure with your entire body and nervous system being activated with sexual energy, which is like rocket fuel with your manifestation. So it accelerates the entire process. When I started doing this practice, I was doing it solo. And before I knew it, my girlfriends were like, we want to do sex magic. And I was like, with me, you know, like the, like the ex Catholic, like girl was just like, huh? And before I knew it, I'm like standing there with like 20 naked women in the middle of the forest doing sex magic. And I was like, I guess I'm a fucking witch. Oh, cool. <laughs> like, a cool thing. I guess I'm actually I used a witch. To, I used to jerk off with my friends into the railroad tracks when I was like 12 years old. It's your own we version of it. We had some pornos down there. <laughs> I don't think that was sex magic. <laughs> it could in be now. Roarstown, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> it's the teenage boy longing for like a circle of sex witches to do it with. I wanted with, to be a warlock. 
something that's interesting <laughs> is what I feel like you are saying, and uh, like, an, like a, uh, I just did a podcast with Dr. David Spiegel, who he's like the world's premier expert on hypnosis and yeah. psychiatry and things of the sort. And I'd recommend people listen to that conversation because it would pair very well with this. And he broke down all of the, the whole neuroanatomy of what's happening in a hypnotic state or a trance state, and it's down regulation of the anterior cingulate cortex, which is like the executive function network center in the brain and it's upregulation of the insula which is like responsible for interoception mind body relationship um down regulation of the uh oh shoot what's it called salience network which is kind of like the thing that has judgment and you hear a sound in the background or a sign or like oh like fire huh yes instead of all of that you just have ah just isness yes ah so that's why when someone is in a hypnotic state uh, or trance state they're able to be told to cluck like a chicken or able to reduce all of the pain in their back or their foot or their knee or reduce their headache or their allergies or their fear or whatever because they don't have definition and story about that because they're actually in the body. Yes. So they've they've upregulated this mind body interoceptive relationship and they've also integrated some of those centers in the brain so they're deeply attentive in attention while also being deeply spaciousness and or spacious and connected to the body and reducing judgment. So it feels like as you're describing this, this like sex magic, ecstatic orgasmic state, it seems like there's like some proximity there. It seems like you're kind of like entering into similar realms where you can start to tap in to your identity structure. Yes. So that's that's exactly it. And so in my Vita methodology, which is a tantric approach to sex, love, and relationships, it actually is a deep study of what you're doing in the nervous system, oh. which it's cool for our minds to understand. But at the end of the day, all that matters is that you do the practices. Yeah. That's exactly what you're doing in these sexuality practices. You're down-regulating the salience network. You're down-regulating prefrontal cortex, judgment, control, um, uh, I like future ideation basically, mm. and you are activating the insula and the sense of beingness, your own interoception. So you get this rich world of feeling. So cool. And what's so powerful <laughs> about that is we tend to tell ourselves like, oh, I'm just not that kind of person, you yeah. know, or like for so many men, it's like, I long to feel like a fucking sex God. Like I long to feel that way, but I've got maybe all these stories that tell me like, if I don't look a certain way, if I it wasn't, you know, whatever, super popular in school for women, it's like, oh, I'm not that type of woman, you know? And we have this huge split. It's still Madonna and whore. Like I get to be mm. a fucking mega slut or I can be like a chair wife who like, you know, maybe has like a mistress or whatever, like these toxic stories. And so part of my work is to train people that your sexual expression is not based on like, oh, I'm worthy. Sexuality is a human right. Like mm -hmm. we all have the gift of like fucking in the most magnificent way and having the most incredible orgasmic experiences and being deeply intimate. It's these stories in our nervous system and our conditioning that put us into these judgmental disconnected states that make us not able to tap into the depth of who we can be as lovers. Mm. And that's so, so, so important for all of us to actually go on that healing journey. And what's powerful as well is I think one of the ways that humanity got deeply disempowered over the last few thousand years is we actually got told fragmented stories. So if you think of our energy centers, right, we've got like sexual primal energy center, we've got heart center, and we've got spirit, third eye. And the story that many of us got told, regardless of gender, is like as a woman, like you either get to be a slut and that's it. That's the defining feature, right? You get to be like a whore or a mistress or whatever, but then you don't get to be like loved and adored and cherished. Mm -hmm. You certainly don't get to be like spiritually revered. Yeah. For men, it's like, yeah, you're either you're like an asshole, you're like a fucking like bro, you're like you, you go out and fuck, you're a player. Like, what do we think of of men who have like a deeply expressed sexuality? We're like player, right? We don't even have a term for a man who's like super primally sexually expressed. And like, yeah, what if he treats his lovers like fucking queens and goddesses? Like, what if he's a gift to every woman that he comes across? I think the player comes with dishonesty. But we like true. Yes. And I don't even think we have a concept sometimes of like a man whose primal sexuality is a gift to everyone around him, Yeah, you know, if he's not married, but like it could be. And where that comes from is the integration. Cause then as women, it's like, okay, you get to be the good girl. You get to be in your heart. You get to be loved. You get to have like the amazing boyfriend as hu and husband, but like, 
do you like better not be too slutty or like have sex just the right way yeah. right for men it's like you get to be this like feeling loving gentle man or whatever who's like in his heart but like like disconnect from your primal sexuality or like for women we got like yeah you could be spiritually you know powerful but like you're gonna be a witch in the woods with like some like gnarly nose like who eats babies like we got like the shit scared out of us like how dare you try and unlock the door of like your own witchcraft and power because like those those women are insane and they die alone like that programming goes so deep when actually like i stand here as like a modern witch and say like no you can be like so loved and so powerful and so successful and so glittery and so magical as a witch like it doesn't have to look like that like that's actually not the truth you can live in a cave by yourself which i want to a lot of the time i'm like i want to go live in a cave by myself and throw rocks at people but like <laughs> That's not the only thing available to you. And for men, what has the cultural story been? If you're you're spiritually activated in Europe, right? You get to be a priest. Sorry, you're celibate. Like maybe you as a man, you can have like like spirituality and heart, but you don't get to have primal sexuality. Yeah. So part of the healing for us, the re-empowerment is like, what if we can be all of it? Like, what if we can have our primal fuck? What if we can reclaim ourselves as lovers, whether we're in a long-term monogamous partnership or not, and actually be the most loving people, like have the depth of our intimate capacity and poetic nature activated and be in our spiritual sovereignty. They all start to line up. And my feeling about it, like my experience is when you start to wake up your sexuality, like really wake it up, really do these pleasure practices. It's only a matter of time before you find your way back to that aligned sovereignty. Mm. And so it's important for people to realize that we've actually been taught to be afraid of that aligned sovereignty for a long time. We've been taught to fragment ourselves so we lose our power. So reclaiming your sexuality, it's more than just doing some practices. It's actually coming back to a sort of primal power. And a lot of us have been terrified about it. And the reason we sort of roll our eyes and dismiss it is because we've been culturally taught to be afraid of being that powerful again. Mm -hmm. And so overcoming that is super important. You have to overcome that, like literally like thousands of years of religious programming and social control that I think is at the root of a lot of it. Then you have to overcome all the like social conditioning that like you're not good enough, you're not wanted enough, you're not attractive enough. Then you have to overcome trusting your body, like being afraid of your body's impulses, right? For men, it's like, you know, needing to have a just the right erection for just the right amount of time last just long enough, give her this many orgasms. Like, can you imagine how much all that control puts you back in prefrontal cortex? Yeah, like, stuck in your brain. Ain't no insula in that. Mm -hmm. And so this trust of like, if I could get into that level of power and primal power, what if I could trust my body? Mm -hmm. And actually, what if we rewrite the sexual narrative? Like, who the fuck cares if you lose your erection? Yeah. You know, if you're in it with your lover and that depth of connection, like, let's trust the moment rather than need to control it so hard. Yeah, it seems, so, I, so we've done like a bunch of, I don't know, a lot of different podcasts on sexuality and such. And I think my previous self had asked a lot of kind of mechanical questions. Yeah. You know, of like, okay, what do I, this is at the top left corner of the, of the clit. Okay. And then we list this, or use this tool. And then, and I feel like my present self is feeling like more like, like the, 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 the most, erogenous intimate erotic sexy thing that can transpire between two people is trust and surrender yeah and so what are the building blocks to create that space between partnership to be able to open up to all of the different firework type stuff can we take sex magic before i answer that oh yeah let's go oh yeah we got some stuff <laughs> let's i'm ready to op open up my my portals <laughs> So there's breath work, there's sex magic, there's energy practices, but first supplements. <laughs> yeah. So what are, so, all right. So that's another, so that's another question. Um, so as far as mechanical, we'll go back to the mechanical for, for a moment. A part of, of who we are is the things that we place into our body, such as food. Um, what are some uh, food sources, supplements, things of the sort, herbs, whatever that we can place into our, our bodies that will kind of boost the old libido? Well, it's amazing. So I, I we're talking about Mood, which is this uh, sexy supplement company um, that I've created, and I I humbly can say that I made these, and I didn't even trust plant consciousness enough. I was like, oh yeah, plants are powerful, and they can definitely support our nervous system to be in a state of erotic aliveness. That is absolutely possible. And even for women, it's like 
the reason that you don't have like some FDA approved aphrodisiac that's like blowing everyone's minds is because you can't just make a woman feel sexual desire. Right. What you can do is put her nervous system in the state where sexual desire is the most natural expression for her. So what's happening right now for women is we're so stressed, overworked in our heads all the time that when we go to make love, we're making love from the head, which isn't sensual. It's not activating. It's not erotic. And so we feel like, okay, I don't have any sexual desire anymore, but actually my nervous system is just not in the state because of modern society being so exhausting, so overwhelming. So what you can do is use plants and herbs Things like kana, cacao, flavonoids, sacred lotus, huperzine A. It's this amazing moss that's actually like a proven aphrodisiac. Um, things like panax ginseng, um, L-theanine. There's all there's all kinds of stuff. Um, one of my favorite pieces, uh, maca, ashwagandha. There's also PQQ, like using different supplements, CoQ10, that uh, fire up the clean energy of your mitochondria because people use that usually for health and fitness, but you can use it to want sex. Like a lot of the time, the reason that we're not so into sex is because we're actually exhausted. Yeah. Like we're working so hard. And so uh, supporting your nervous system with all these different ingredients actually makes sex not only more pleasurable, makes you more likely to want it. Not to mention that like the reason I created this company was like in my long-term partnership, I was like, I'm like, I know all the tools and practices. Like I know all the breath work. I know all the like, you know, the, here's my like giant crystal egg up my yoni, like woo! And I would get off of work and I'd have like a sex date with my partner and I'd be like, fuck, like I'm tired. And I'd be like, what can I do? I don't drink alcohol. Plus, I don't want to have a hangover at work tomorrow. And I basically it's a shot of coffee. Like what's going to make me feel OK? It's fucking 5 p.m. If I take a shot of coffee now, I'm not going to sleep. I was like, there's got to be something really sexy that you can take that actually like puts you in the mood, makes you want sex. And coffee is also a vasoconstrictor. This line was born. Yeah. Oh, OK. What about just good old fashioned weed? <laughs> you know, you smoke a little weed, have some sex. You definitely, yeah. I saw your connection to weed and eroticism the other night. It was there. I was like, I'm, yeah. I'm an advocate. Um, all right. Can we take some of this, some of this goodness here? How Let's do, we, do how, it. How do we go? So what I loved is I came and I was like, yo, do you have two cups? And you were no, like, no, 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 no. This is one boy, one girl, one cup. Is what we're going to call this podcast. <laughs> I think it's one boy, one girl, and an old dirty coffee cup. Uh, yeah. Oh, not that old. <laughs> Whatever. All, All right. right. So we're going to put two scoops in it. All right. What if I do two I and a half? I think if you put water in first, let's do two and a half water. Right, so it's going to make it dissolve easier. Crunchy. All right. Here you go, cracker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did that turn you on a little bit? You're cracking the can? Some BPA-free plastic in the interior of the can? Probably not. Probably actually some... <laughs> <laughs> this is I'm simultaneously reducing my sperm count while I'm boosting my sperm count. Four play ideas from Eric's Aaron Alexander crack a can in her presence. I feel so hot right now. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna do more than two scoops because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a lot of no, so it's one scoop each. So you do however oh, many you want, but I'm it's got my scoops. scoop in there too, right? <laughs> All right, hold on. What if we just do like two and a half I'm and we it. just split it? Okay, is that cool? Yeah. We could sip it at the same time. We'll and we're see. also going to take ecstasy. By this one, is legal ecstasy. By two scoops and a half, I mean three scoops. You can obviously <laughs> tell my personality. <laughs> yeah. Whatever you said, like, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. Two hours later, I'm like tremoring in the corner, jacking off. Right. Honestly, that's the Instagram <laughs> clip that people want to see. Like, that's, that's, that's what's going to get you a that's million. That's the move. That's the future. <laughs> a million subscribers. The world's ready. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, should I do a little like finger, yeah, yeah, finger yeah. swirl? We call this a sex magic finger swirl. All right, that is a little bit erotic. One of my, that's starting one, of my <laughs> one of my favorite terms that I like to introduce into sentences in a haphazard way is finger bang <laughs> and flick in the bean. Those are my two like absolute favorite. And are you like testing the person in front of you? Oh, like yeah. if you're not down with flicking the bean and yeah, finger banging, yeah. like we're and like we're not we're not down. Like no matter what the gonna, nature this of this connection, work. this is not going any further. This isn't, isn't going to work. All right, I just I just uh, f finger banged your sacred Amrita juice here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a slow central finger bang is the best kind. You didn't. I'm go here so for it. Yeah. We do need to get into some mechanics as well. Let's do it again. So let's talk about trust and safety. Lost, yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Trust and safety. This, you put so much, it could use a little more water. I don't give a shit. Fun. 
No, we are going hard. We are going dense. We are going hard. We are going fast. This is. I've, I've obviously watched way too much porn. It's influenced my the way that I make drinks. <laughs> <laughs> there is no sensuality in this beverage. Well, you know, hard and fast is really quite fucking pleasurable once you've had the sensuality to time, start. Time and a place for it. Mm-hmm. Gotta warm up. Doesn't the clit expand something like like 500 times when it's engorged compared to not? I, I'm kind of making the 500 number up, but it's like a lot. It, it expands a lot. I would also say a lot because I don't know the exact amount that it expands. So, yeah. All right, yeah. we're going to take these Anywho. two. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to sh- shake in the corner and both be masturbating. Uh, crying all right here you go i've been turned on this whole podcast so i don't think this this these pills are gonna make any difference (laughs) (laughs) and i just think i drank way more than my share of that cup so we're locked in we're locked and loaded we'll put a little bit to your side in case you want more i just smacked my my phallic microphone i am ready to go I'm doing this for the listeners. <laughs> Something else that's interesting while you ingest that. So the the medulla oblongata and the pons are two brain segments that are they uh, regulate breathing function, respiratory function in the body, and they happen to be the bridge between the spine and the brain. So they're at the brain stem, which is interesting because all the esoteric Eastern stuff suggests that, and it just is, uh, you know, the breath is like the bridge between the mind and the body. It fucking literally is mm-hmm. from a from mm-hmm. an anatomical perspective. Mm-hmm. How do you feel? Feel hot? I. <laughs> <laughs> You got to give it like five to ten minutes. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Well, what's interesting. So before all of the breathwork research started to come out, I actually uh, cornered Andrew Hoberman at like a summit uh, series. So this is like whatever. It's like a fancy networking. Like yeah. it's like cool parties for like networking. Um, it's a little cooler than that. And I w- had been using breathwork for, you know, over a decade. And what I observed was like, you know, the claw hands, basically tetany, pe- and people do that with their hands when they're losing cortical control. So that's why babies do it when they're really young, because they haven't yet developed cortical control networks. And when people actually have degenerative brain disease where cortical control is being downregulated or um, being degraded over time, sadly, their hands do the same thing. So because that's what people are doing when they start dropping into the breathwork state, before all this research came out, I was like, are you seeing in your research that breathwork takes down cortical control and that would switch someone's nervous system from a controlling future-oriented, goal-oriented state into not only being and feeling, but into connection to the limbic system, into connection even to the parts of you that are holding deeper trauma, unhealed wounds, unexpressed pieces. And eventually, if you keep breathing, it puts you into a primal state where it's like your body takes back over. And the important thing I think to remember is primal sex Sex is the absolute best sex. It's like when you're yeah. not in your head, you're fully present and your body, your body is doing whatever it wants to do. And we have a fear of this in society now, um, obviously with consent culture. So you're doing it with someone where it's fully consensual. But for a lot of women, they have experienced disconnected men going hard and fast when their bodies weren't a full yes, when their bodies weren't fully open. Yeah. Also, most of the stuff you see in porn is actually stuff that women desire deep down inside. This might be triggering if it's taken out of context, but it's true. I found it to be absolutely true that when a woman is deeply fucking turned on, deeply surrendered, deeply in it, not every woman all the time, but a lot of women can like, like, I want you to come on my face. Like, I want to be choked. Like, I want anal sex. Like, I want to be pounded. Like, those desires exist in women. But the great sort of, like, tragedy of our society, number one, not all women want that when they're in a deeply surrendered state. Like, every woman is different. However, a lot of women can find that level of, like, what I would call primal desire. But what happens is it unlocks within her, like this is literally almost bringing tears in my eyes because it's it's so deep. It unlocks in a woman when she is in the most profound state of sexual surrender, activation, desire, and safety, and usually love as well. Like love has to be there even, like it could be monogamous partnership, but it could be lovership as long as there's love. 
she can unlock the wildest, most epic desires, right? Those parts of the brain that are full of judgment and social control, those have to go quiet for her to have the absolute best sex. When she's in that state, the wildest, most incredible things can be desired. But what's happened is like with pornography culture, they took women who are not in that state, who actually don't consent to that or don't want it and used it as almost an expression of male dominance and control. And so what's happened is a lot of women have actually disconnected from their primal desire because we got raised in a culture where our primal desire was used against us. And so there's a, there's, there's a fucking tragedy there because most men don't even know the beauty of a woman wanting anal sex that bad, wanting your cum on her face that bad because she loves you that fucking much, right? Or if it is dominance and control, it's deeply consensual BDSM, right? That's built out of trust and love. I feel like that's what men are actually hungry for, straight or bisexual men in relationship to the feminine, but they don't even know how to get there anymore. Because if you've been so programmed by pornography, you think like, oh, it's about just like coming on her face or like getting into her asshole or whatever, rather than like, my God, God, if I knew how to fucking open her, where her nervous system was super turned on, she would crave that from me in the depths of her being. And that's actually the kind of sex that would fulfill me. Yeah. It's like with that, it's, it's like your program to go to stage 10 when you're at like not even stage one yet. Yeah. And, and I think that stage one, two, three, four, whatever is trust is compassion is connection is nurturing is support is dependability yeah. is being a container you know and allowing the woman or whatever the feminine to feel safe to be able to express and to be able to allow themselves to unwind and let themselves go and feel like if i fall you'll catch me yeah now can we start to push those boundaries even more and like what if i really fall yeah. like will you still catch me and then you start to get into those places where it might start looking a little pornographic yeah you know, but but I think what we see is we see almost like this toxic version of that in yeah. in, in porn uh, with girls that obviously like they're they haven't been worked up to that point. There's there's no love or connection. Typically, I'd imagine maybe every they're doing it again. for money, you know, yeah, which is totally different. And so that's the experience that you're being imprinted with that. And then you probably get subconsciously the, the education that like, OK, that's what it means to be a man. And that's maybe perhaps what it means to be a woman. Uh, and you're really missing all the juice of the whole thing. Yeah. It seems absolutely. Yeah. You know, so, so I guess starting off ground ground floor, um, it's not maybe not as sexy. Well, probably for women, it might be more sexy to talk about. Uh, how do we start to develop that foundation of trust, love, connection, support to build ourselves into like the kinky, nasty, fuck me to oblivion type place? Yes. Um, so I think you just mentioned some of the pieces for the masculine, and I think also just to really know what. Be really clear on what you can show up for, whatever the container is, and make that very clear. Because if you start having that level of sex with someone, it's going to be emotionally vulnerable. It's going to open up anybody's body, no matter how much you are just lovers versus married forever. And even if you are married forever, like what does it look and feel like for you to show up and to make that very explicit to her? Um, I think as well, like starting to make it safe for women to feel everything during sex. Mm. So actually encouraging, like if she starts crying, be like, yes, like cry as deep, as hard as you want. Like I've got you and hold her. Same as raising a child. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. You, which in probably sex, you're probably taking each other in a way through like parts of your child but self. Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, like to fully unlock those levels of the nervous system in sex is to unlock all kinds of expression, right? Yeah. And so letting, if there's like conscious rage, right? Not toxic, not aggressive, anything like that, but literally like opening into like ragey states of sex or like fear-based states. If she shuts down, if trauma comes up, like what does mm. it look like to be like, you are safe, this is okay. Mm. And wow. for people of both genders to say like, this is a safe space for you to be yourself. And I'm not here expecting you to show up like X, Y, and Z for my gratification. I'm showing up so that you can be the most thriving expressed version of yourself. That intention changes everything. And you and I have talked about this actually in private, a big thing for everybody, but a big thing for the feminine is being self-responsible with your expression and your pain. Mm. 
and starting to understand men in deeper ways. So like I got raised to believe that like men are these like all powerful beings that like, yeah, I'm going to say it, like they took all the fucking resources <laughs> and like all the spots at the top and all the CEO positions and all the political power and like all the spiritual power. And they're like these like men who are like tough and strong and big or whatever. And like you just basically have to like try and figure out how to like appease them in some way, shape or form to survive, which creates a level of bitterness. It creates a level of disdain. And so where most women actually get conditioned with men in a way that is is not safe, is not trustworthy, is like, fuck you, I'm in all this pain, like I have all this trauma and like the whole world was made for you and you're supposed to be this big strong man and like, like therefore if you do anything that I don't like, I feel this level of like emotional justification to just like tear you down. Oh yeah. And when I feel, and, and I want to have compassion for my sisters, right? Like where we've come from of just like, my God, even a few generations ago, you know, I, I and I'm talking a privileged woman probably in society, like m everything relied on my husband, right? If I was lucky enough to even have a husband. So I'm sitting here, the money you make, the choices you make, whether you want to be a drug addict or not, whether you want to fuck outside the marriage or not, like it's all up to you. And I'm sitting here just trying to raise the kids, don't have a job, don't have a plan B. Mm. So my only source of power, if I have become that bitter and that disempowered is to cut you down. Like that's the only way that I can wrestle some level of control. And harden yourself. And harden myself. But my God, the pain, the lack of safety, right? And then when a man is receiving that, what do you do? You become defensive or aggressive and shut down. And then I become more angry because now you're shut down. Or if you're, if you are another version a, a man could go would be, it could be emasculinating and then they could become small and enable you to be in your toxic masculine. Yes. And exactly. I'm just like, okay, you're right, honey. I'm so sorry. I'm so yeah. sorry. You know, just grovel. Yeah. Another, yeah. another, another direction. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Equally shit. <laughs> totally. And then I'm going to go see like a hooker to feel powerful again right. or whatever the exactly. like. Exactly. Okay, I'll find is. femininity somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not to excuse cheating, but like yeah. you can understand how these patterns play out. Right. And then women are left so sad because they're not receiving the gift of the masculine and they're getting less and less surrendered and open and more and more judgmental and critical. And men are becoming more and more hardened and distrustful of the feminine. Right. And then we lose each other. Yeah. We forget together and we remember together. So part of the training for women to create safety again is to see through that conditioning mm -hmm. and to actually realize that like men feel very deeply, yeah. like even the most masculine alpha of men feel so deeply. Right. And like are like actually can be so in touch with themselves. So intuitive. Right. So like it, poetic inside of their beings, like some of the most beautiful poetry in the world. Alison Armstrong points this out. It's like written by men, right? You read like alpha male song lyrics and it's fucking like, oh, right? Like the depth of feeling in a man's heart and soul is, is, is exquisite. Mm. And so part of the programming for a woman to create trust and safety is to know that like no matter who the man is in front of you, he actually doesn't usually show it, but he feels so deeply. And so when you say shitty things, like he feels it, it actually hurts. And as a woman as well, it's like understanding that like men take time to open up and trust and they trust you over time if you prove that you're trustworthy, if you don't mm. use their sharing against them and you don't actually say like, I expect you to be some perfect version of a man or else like I'm going to attack you. Can you imagine what that would feel like as a woman? If a man was like, you have to be a perfect version of a woman or I'm going to attack you. It's not easy. It's horrible. Yeah. So like in for, that, for people. there's a lot of deconditioning of masculine feminine dynamics if you're in heterosexual partnership to be able to, to find trust and safety again. Like it's a whole process. So I say that in deep acknowledgement that we can say like, yeah, show up and like hold your partner during sex and to be truly safe, it can amount to like a deep rewiring of what we've been told about each other so that we can get back to genuine compassion and safety. And then that's where trust comes from. Yeah. Um, I just want to like clap. <laughs> like I'm like, wow. Um, how does a, so what is a woman that she's finding herself? Cause I feel like probably more women 
at least in my experience and observation, are going through this um, unhardening process yeah. within themselves. Yeah. How does a woman begin that process within herself if she does find herself in a place of what you just described? Well, I'll give big shout out to Alison Armstrong for, for yeah. my re-education in this. So she has uh, a book called The Queen's Code and uh, a program called Understanding Men that I found so, so helpful where you actually do realize like what is it in me that looks at a man like i did this i did this to my ex-partners and i was like if you do x y and z it's this like horrific problem and like you're sure as fuck gonna know about it from me right mm -hmm. and like a big part of that was realizing that i just didn't understand men i didn't mm -hmm. understand how they emotionally express i didn't understand how they process like one of the pieces of gold she gave me she was like, women actually think and process faster than men. We communicate faster than men. So when you're listening to a man and he pauses, count to 30 and he'll likely keep going. And like, he will actually, mm. and like, if you interrupt him, you're actually emasculating him, but you'll never hear what he truly has to say. And I was like, oh, I, I started practicing it and I would just shut the fuck up sometimes and it would be like, whoa, the things that like men would share with me. And I was like, have I been missing out on listening, like really hearing men my entire life? And she taught this really amazing thing, which is like as women, like we have this joy of just chatting, right? Like really just saying whatever we want to say and super chatting. And it's like, oh, it's so fulfilling and it's so fun. And there's like the good kind of drama in it. But a man often will want to tell you the truth. And so he takes his time so that he tells you what is very real to him and that that is a slower more thoughtful process and so like as women we've been like what is taking so like what like what's with the like like why are you not sharing your like the depth of your soul with me right. rather than actually giving the space and time for a man to be truly heard mm. and it goes both ways right because like i'm not going to sit there and just like listen to a man talk for the rest of my life like that would be kind of buying back into patriarchy, but it's reciprocal. Like if I am giving a man the space and time to be a man and he is giving me the support and love to be a woman, then it really starts working. Something that I, I, I could um, probably do better in my life in relation to uh, women, uh, romantic partnerships would be not judging a woman when she's in a place of being fussy, angry, shut down. Mm -hmm. She's, ruining the moment yeah. you know like come on like <laughs> come on like why are you doing this like do better you know and instead be in a place of like okay like i i i can what i'm doing in in, in that and when any guy would be doing it or any person would be doing in that is exactly what would be very unwise to do with a child mm. you know a child's angry yeah it's like all right yeah. What are you angry? At? Like I can be with this. This yeah. doesn't scare me. Yeah. A child's sad. Like oh okay. Like this doesn't scare me. A child's yeah. happy. Like equally. This this also doesn't scare me. Totally. And I'm not attached to any of these places. I'm just going to allow you to effuse and process and metabolize and be. And you're safe to be whatever you'd like. Yeah. You know. And that's like gets you out of like the the Chinese finger trap situation where you're like trying to pull and it just gets tighter and tighter. It's like what if we just I just accept you where you're at, as opposed to judging. Yeah. You know, and then also at some point, hopefully we have some type of container of sorts where we can have conversation and I'm able to share like my experience as well. And it's not just about the woman always having her emotional experience and not really having spaciousness for the, for the man to have feelings. Yeah. Cause I feel like that can, you know, I don't know that that's something that I've experienced in relationships where it's like, you have so much feelings. There's no space for me to have an experience. Yes. Yes. It's just about me holding your experience. <laughs> like <laughs> what do i do with that <laughs> you know <laughs> well i think so so i think something that's helpful for people to understand in this is it's it's like what is the story that you're telling yourself about the person in front of you yeah. and when you talk about why it's so easy to be with a child's anger or sadness is like you don't stop saying the goodness of the child just because they're angry or just because mm -hmm. they're sad. You also like tell yourself the story where you understand you're like, oh yeah, they're angry because that other child stole their toy or because like daddy's been gone for a really long time or they're crying right now because they scraped their knee. And so Annie Lala, an amazing love coach, she taught me that one of the best ways to love people is to give them the best PR in your head that you possibly could. Mm -hmm. And so like 
the story that we tell ourselves, like if you're sitting there with that woman who's super angry, right? And you're being like, what a fucking bitch, you know? Like right. always just sitting here ready to tear down yeah. the fucking you're goodness heart, of the moment. You're harsh and the mellow. Yeah. You had a vibe. Totally. You're so emotional. Yeah. <laughs> You're ruining the moment. You're the moment. <laughs> and who wants, like, like, ah, oh, you know, if instead, <laughs> let's say you trade it out with like, part of being a woman is like loving the feminine drama of things, right? right? Like, I want to be in like a little bit of a drama about like the dinner tonight or the like, ex or like the, the experience that we're having or whatever. Like a spinning, like light form of drama is part of that like energy moving through her. And this is part of trust as well, because like for me, there's a huge difference between some light feminine drama and genuine toxicity, right? Yeah. So the difference between me being like, oh, <gasps> Oh, like, you know, I like, I wore this dress and like, I was so excited about it, but now I feel like it doesn't fit at all. And I kind of want to go back home and change the whole fucking thing. And like, but we're always late to parties. Like, fine. Right. Yeah. That's cute. If I'm just like, if I'm like, you're always making us late to parties and now I feel bad in my dress. Right. There's right. a tip when you go from playful, yeah. energetic, like fun, loving drama that feels true in the moment to like toxic. Toxic I, is I degrading. Have, I have deep unprocessed trauma and pain. And instead of me holding it and navigating it with myself, I'm going to pour that onto you. Yes. And I want you to hold this with me. Yes. Yes. So it's like an emotional hygiene thing, I think. Yes. And one of the great trainings of the feminine that I don't think gets shared enough is self-responsibility. Mm -hmm. So like I am someone who has a tremendous amount of trauma, as you talked about. I was actually sexually abused between like the age of like two and three to seven instead of nine. That was the only thing you no, got wrong. No, no, I didn't mention the age. The, you said the nine. Age, nine is when you didn't, you shared another podcast that you were scared to become a woman. I didn't mention the age. Oh, of the, okay, I, didn't, okay, I didn't know okay. the age of the sexual trauma. <laughs> well, now everyone does. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry that that happened to you. Thank or, you. Or however, whatever the best language for that is. Yeah, thank you. I really... Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And like, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's hard talking about trauma because I never want to like, I never want to skip over it. So anyone who's experienced that trauma doesn't feel seen. Right. It's like, that's taken more from me in my life than I could ever account for. Yeah. Like the level of like pain and fucking challenges with men and fucking heartbreak and self-loathing and like moments alone. Like I cannot articulate that. Mm. And one of the things that I stand for and have stood for is like, you can integrate your trauma to a place where like, I can actually genuinely laugh about it with you on a podcast, you know? Yeah. And like, that's, so it's both hopeful and always wanting to acknowledge the depth of that trauma. And as someone who like in my life has screamed at men, has called them names, has emasculated them, has like, I am not proud of the way that I treated good men in my life. Mm. It is heartbreaking. Mm. And one of the biggest pieces was like, I don't know what to do with this level of pain. Right. Please, please, like some way that you could show up, something you could say, some way you could hold me will make it better. And I think one of the most like heartbreaking, hardest things to realize on your trauma journey, and I want to say, especially as a woman is like, no one can save me. Like no man, no matter how loving, how good, how well-intentioned, how fucking divine masculine can go back to like 1986, 1987 and make it all better. Yeah. You know, like he just can't. And so it's, it's truly, this is something that I think gets missed to love well, to love a man well as a woman. It's a ninja level training mm. because now I have to recognize the difference between my energy flow, which I want alive in partnership, which I want alive between me and a man. And the moment that my trauma starts to kick in, I actually have to self protect the man in front of me from my right. own trauma and actually say, hey babe, I'm feeling triggered right now, or I'm feeling like deeply stressed or something is happening inside of me. I don't actually know what it is right now, but I need to withdraw to like give myself some space and time to figure out what it is. All of those things create safety in a partnership and start to build that foundational safety and sexuality. And that can go for a man too. Like if you know you've got complex PTSD, if you know you've got anger issues, if you know you lash out, if you know you say kind of negative things sometimes to your partner, start to track what happens in your nervous system right before you're gonna do that and start to self-protect mm. and protect her from that because you can learn to do that. It's not about not having trauma. It's not about not getting triggered. I actually track now in my nervous system the moment that I start going into trigger or trauma and that's when I actually consciously withdraw and, and speak it to my partner. Mm. 
And sometimes I'm like, hey, I, I can't even give words to it right now, but I need to go inwards and, and take care of myself. That can save a whole fucking marriage. That can save a whole relationship because you cannot take back things that you say. You can't take back hurt over time. And so starting to protect your relationship like you would your beloved child mm. helps build that trust and safety in a way that is so important. Mm. Yeah, there's a, a book I like called How to Be an Adult in Relationship, David Rico. Are you familiar with that one? Mm -mm. All? You, you enjoyed it, I'm sure. Um, but in that, he talks about like an arc in relationship. And the first phase is the romance phase. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, last, whatever, last six months, whatever it is. And in that time, you idolize each other and you see like the perfect version of each other's egos. Like everything is great. Everything's magic. Oh, my God. All my childhood stuff is over. Like this is I'm just in bliss. <laughs> Limerence. This is the best thing ever. Then that starts to that part starts to get tired and you start to actually become like the like your true self, you know, and all like the, the darker aspects of your ego start to come to the surface in relation to that person's. And then you go through what, the, what he calls the conflict phase. Mm. And then on the other side of that is deep connection and trust and like another level of depth yeah. that wasn't available on like the superficial limerence romance phase. Yeah. And I feel like it, it, within this conversation, it, like we're talking about orgasmic stuff and ecstasy and you know, all, all of the things. Uh, and I think it, the, like the deep, deep root, if a person wants to unlock their sexuality and their romance and their connection and all of like that magic, I think you need to go into the muck. And you yes. need to go into the darkness. Yeah. And on the other side of that, you know, like the way, the way, how do they say it? The way, way over, way whatever is through. The way in is through. The yeah. way, the way out, the way out is through. <laughs> like if you, if you, if you do go through on the other side of that, then suddenly there is this deep level of trust and intimacy and connection. And then that deep little girl part and deep little boy part and like soul level feels safe to surrender in a way that they probably couldn't have in Absolutely. any of the other versions of the, of the relationship well then what happens is you become safe spaces to be alive with each other because if you can be with each other in what's real in what's actually happening between you be it inner girl inner, inner little girl inner little boy but just like whatever is processing through my life you actually activate ceremonial space between you mm. and if you think about it a ceremony never gets boring like taking ayahuasca never gets boring. Taking LSD never gets boring. Being fully alive never gets boring. Mm. The reason we get boring to each other is because we lose the safety to be alive together. Mm. When you're alive together, sex stays interesting. Mm. If, you, if you're not being alive together, you're not telling each other the truth. You're not processing your shadows in responsible ways. How long can you really fuck each other and keep it interesting? Yeah, slamming each other's bodies against, you know, each other is... <laughs> Can only be interesting for so long. Right. It's right. that deeper emotional vulnerability and revelation of self that can make sex even better than the honeymoon period mm. when you really deep dive into it. What's been the most informative, supportive thing for you to get into actually processing and metabolizing the darkness, shadow, and muck of your experienced traumas that have been held through your adult life? Oh, yeah, Aaron, good question. So. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Just that like, was a great response. Lick the darkness, you that know? Was, that was good. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> You know I like a response when I kick my feet. That's my that's when I get excited. One kick, two kick. <laughs> yeah. All right. So stage one of loving my like deep shadowy pieces. Um I'll say something. Okay, I'll talk I'll like I will talk about something vulnerable. So like one of the ways that I coped with my trauma, um, was to want to keep men at an arm's length. Yeah. So I developed a bunch of like self-loathing, self-hating, self-rejecting belief systems. Everything from like, I'm not lovable, I'm not worthy enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, like oh, this whole complex of self-loathing, right? So you could call that like your, your classic shadow yeah. complex. All, or pro all protective mechanisms for the most part. Exactly, stay yeah. away from me because yeah. I yeah. am all these things. Yeah. And if I'm that unworthy, like we're not gonna be able to be that intimate. Yeah. And I think actually all self-loathing is a defense mechanism against the deepest intimacy and love. Yeah. 
And so when I start to feel that self-loathing, right, the kind of condition response is like, got to get away. For me, it's like I move towards it. Like, can I, like, can I love you? Again, like, can I treat you like you were my beloved, precious child? So like self-loathing, literally, it's like, can I like hold you in my arms and cradle you and like hold you with, with the deepest care? And there's research, you know, there's there's research backed um, evidence for this, which is when you do that, you actually like trauma exists by being disconnected in your brain. Like it gets like direct access to the amygdala, but it gets disconnected from all these other parts of you, which is why when you go into a trauma state, it's like you fucking blackout yeah. or like it's like some other part of you comes online. Yep. And so when you actually consciously love your shadow parts, you're building neural networks of love. So that's how, when I was like talking about, I track when my trauma kicks in, I couldn't do that. You know, when I was a teenager, my trauma would just blindside me because I hadn't created the neural networks of love. Now when my trauma arises, because I've chosen to love it so often, the vast majority of the time, it's literally wired into a nervous system experience of love. And so now when I experience trauma, it's not like a blackout disconnection of rage or pain. It's the rage and the pain, but the love has now been wired in because I've chosen to love it over and over and over again. And it's changed my brain. How did you develop the resourcefulness to, to be able to make that conscious choice as opposed to being completely blindsided and overwhelmed by the sensation? So just understanding the mechanism of it and making the conscious choice was really important. Also, uh, in the tantric tradition, you're taught that everything is goddess consciousness. So everything is worthy of love. Mm -hmm. Everything is worthy of devotion. So like this is my tantrika kicking in, but I learned before there was a bunch of research on this or that I knew about to be in devotion to the darkest things inside of me mm -hmm. and to be in devotion to them meant to not only love them, but to trust that there was wisdom in them. So when I did that, I I, I started re, like re, like re- it's sort of like we we get told that you should run from the dark things inside of you because that'll make them go away or you should fight them, right? Because that's how you make something go away. But inside of ourselves, we can't make it go away. It's actually wired into our nervous system. Yep. So it's like a child. You can't make the child go away. It's yours forever. So you love it. And so that is the that's the same way to relate to ourselves internally. Like this is here with me forever until it's not. Maybe it gets integrated, but like I can't just make it go away. It's literally in me. And so that choice of love, um, I just started to understand that and make that choice over and over and over again. And when I started to realize that, oh, running from myself is so much more painful than loving myself, I was like, Okay, and then that was like the watershed moment of just choosing to do that. What do you desire from a man in your heterosexual, well, I don't know what your sexual orientation is. You, you <laughs> seem like you're probably a little bi. Uh, <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> what, would you, what would you like to experience from a guy to make you feel safe and comfortable enough to be like your highest, sexiest version of yourself? Mm, 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 mm. So an encouragement, like a literal encouragement of me when I'm not in my like perfect power, mm. right? So like if I'm crying, if I'm expressing from my heart, if I'm having a hard day, just like I fucking celebrate you. Like mm. these parts of you are amazing too. I love all parts of you, babe, but you have to mean it. That's the thing. Right. Like if it's not real, then she'll feel it and it'll create even more distrust. But for me, like that celebration is so important. Mm. Um, especially if I have the courage. So like for me, it can be really easy to like default as a protective mechanism to be like, I'm so perfect and evolved. And like, you know, I can like talk my way through anything or whatever. So for me to bring to a man, like, like this is my self-loathing, you know, like these, like these are my demons that I woke up with today. And like, they're like, they want to eat me, you know, like this is my heartbreak. And this is, this is where I carry shame. Like, this is where I feel not good enough. Um, when I have the vulnerability to share that and to share it in like a really self-responsible, honest way to be met with love mm -hmm. and like encouragement and celebration. And like, usually if it's true, like I love you even more knowing these parts of you, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How would you want to be met by the feminine when you are starting to open up in deeper ways? 
I think it's I think it's the same. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's like the it's, it's the the um trust that no matter what I show or you show, um, I'll be accepted. Yeah. You know, and I think that's the, it's the sooner that you can establish that within. And then ultimately, you know, there's like the Ram Dass quote, the only thing that you can do for me is work on yourself. The only thing that I can do for you is work on myself. Yeah. I think that that's like, this can get into territory where for a guy it's like, okay, cool. Like what I'll do for the woman is I'll like be there for her. Yeah. You know, and it's like there's there's an energetic part where it's if you're not there for yourself on both sides, and you're not equally doing your own self work, investigation, excavation, whatever, um, and you're just there for each other, yeah, but not for yourselves. It will be very hard for there to be growth within that relationship. Yes, you know. So I think that that like like having that that mutual accountability that's like the sexiest thing for me is is it would be a woman that is. Um, in her quote unquote feminine, like nurturing, sweet, soft. She wants to be fluid and she wants to, she's open to chaos and open to color and open to like all the things and yeah. like, like sexuality and sensuality and massage and just like beautiful smells and beautiful sounds and beautiful art and like, ah. Oh. And like I can imagine like like thousands of women signing up for massage courses right now. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, good. It's nice. Um, and simultaneously having that uh, accountability, you know, which I don't know if that's masculine or feminine. I mean, it's just human. But that that ability to, um, if there's a problem, to be able to as neutrally as is possible. It's okay if neutrality is not possible in certain instances, in which case then the moment for the person's resourced enough to like hold the space, like then it's their job to like, okay, like I'll be the anchor while you kind of spin. Um, you know, so it's okay to spin it every now and again, but they're able to come back after the spin and be like, oh wow, like I was reactive as fuck, you know? And like, and, and I, I said some things, I called you some names that wasn't like me that was like a hurt version of me and there's a deeper me that can take responsibility for my reactions Mm. and the ability for both partners to be able to navigate in that way i think that's like incredibly sexy and powerful Mm. totally Mm. that's my response (laughs) um should we tell them now the step-by-step graphic detail techniques of how to get to primal pounding yeah, well, so I think that that's, I think that that's like, I, I'm excited to share. I think for some people, I think for most people probably like, oh, this is, this is really good. Uh, for some folks, maybe they want like the, the primal pounding, which I think that's where we should go next. But that really truly is the foundation for uh, tr- like good sex. Absolutely. And that gets missed in the conversation. Yeah. You can learn all the techniques in the world. You can have the strongest fucking pelvic floor in the world. You can yeah. last like a million years. <laughs> right. And like, if you ain't taking good care of each other and able to reveal your deeper selves, there's yeah. going to be a glass ceiling on your sex. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. How do we primal pound? <laughs> <laughs> gonna- that was one of my written out questions, actually. I've been working on that for the last two days. <laughs> Pull up the old laptop <laughs> notes. How do we primal pound? Never too soon. <laughs> what do you think would be more relevant? What would be? Where do you think the re- like you're you're the you're the coach? Like where where should we go from here? Let's pass. Should we walk them step by step to like how would you get to primal pounding? Like, yeah. like you've, you've laid the like. <laughs> We did the whole emotional framework. Yeah. Like we've got a foundation here, people. Let's fuck. <laughs> you know, it's time to fuck. I didn't do all this emotional healing for nothing. That's you what know? I'm saying. <laughs> you know. <laughs> What's that? I think it's a Tupac. It says this is a shit gets that gets the pussies wet and the dicks hard. That's where we're at. So that's that's where we're going. This is an excellent example of uh, step number one. <laughs> Which is that truly, <laughs> truly, you can't go too fast. <laughs> wow. So I mean this. Okay, mm. pussy. This is like one of the great secrets of pussy. Most pussies have never been given the time that they need to truly open. Yeah, right. Ever. Mm. So whatever amount of time you've spent on pussy, mm. 
Mm. Like times it by four, Mm -hmm. slow it down at least by two, Mm. maybe even more. Mm. And she will open like you have never, ever seen. Mm. You don't have to do that all the time. That doesn't mean you can't have quickies. It doesn't mean you can't fuck each other like whatever in the aisles of the plane sometimes. Like we make space for that. Have you had sex on the aisle of a plane? (laughs) Jesus Christ. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Our, so it's illegal. We, I, I went on a trip to Antarctica where we got banned from National Airlines, but it wasn't me who had sex on the aisles of the plane. <laughs> All right. But literally the pilot came on and was like, if anybody in this crew fucks in the airline bathroom one more time, we're grounding the plane. And just so you know, it's a felony. Oh, wow. You're a bunch of rabbits. It was, it was a strong. Bunch of, bunch of bonobos. Strong trip. Domesticated bonobos. How does that? All right, what's next? I'm actually not a bathroom sex kind of person. So Whoa. anyways. I uh, <laughs> need some wet wipes. Too many microbes. Not into it. No. Not, not down. The smell is definitely off. Yeah, not down. <laughs> so, um, okay. So really think though, like at least once a week, could I give her pussy like so much slower than I thought? Mm. so much slow of a sensual massage like you can massage a vulva the way that you would massage a back mm. right like slow attentive all the nooks and crannies like all of the presence can you do that can you give like pussy so much fucking attention and love that it's like she is slowly opening like could you think of foreplay as an hour mm. um that like the levels to which her body could unlock is it, it will blow your mind i would i would suggest or add um also like extending the vulva out beyond just the actual anatomical vulva yes. anatomical vulva and being like the whole fucking body yes like the body of the vulva yes yes you know? so <laughs> all of the things that you know, like the, the feet and the knees and the hands and the head and like all of that treating that with the same level of care and sensuality and like extend you could even visualize extending it beyond and that's like you're talking about like full body orgasms when all of your attention is one little made up anatomical point yes it would probably stifle capacity for something like a full body situation absolutely so full body situation i was lasering a little bit more but full body situation obviously you'd probably want to like make out before Mm. like you go straight for the vulva like we're talking like all the like erotic buildup that you would expect and anticipate and then (laughs) so here's another really great uh piece for for a man to a woman uh, I've never met a woman yet, I'm not saying she doesn't exist, that doesn't love like oral celebration. Like, and mm. I mean A-U-R-A-L, <laughs> like oral in that like, is that the right way you spell it? You know I think so. Oral. I think so, yeah, yeah. Like oral? like telling her why she's fucking beautiful. Right. Telling her what you love about her. Mm-hmm. Telling her what's exquisite about her. Mm. And also knowing her, like some women, like love being told that their soul is amazing, like how brilliant they are, what, you know, like being celebrated for all these things. Other women love having their physical beauty celebrated. A little objectification feels nice every now and again. Oh, it's so good to be You just objectified. need both. If you're exclusively objectified, it's dead. If yes. you're exclusively like, well, I love your soul and your spirit, it's like, okay, bro, I need to get fucked every now and again too. Totally. You need both. You need both. Yin yang. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that is like super, super powerful. Then as you, it's like you would then as you're touching other parts of her body, breast massage is so amazing. Mm. Like learning the art of like a good slow breast massage because in the Taoist tradition, women open their sexuality through their hearts. Mm. So if you actually give her like a slow luscious breast massage with oil, it's like it also primes open her body in a way that's indescribable. Yeah. Men tend to go cock to heart. Women go heart down to pussy. You're also up their, their breathing within that. And a lot of women have a lot of tension around, particularly if they've had, had um, implants. They're going to have a massive amount of tension in around their intercostal muscles and all the connective tissue around the sternum and just the, the, the whole thing's frozen. So um, indirectly or directly what's happening there as well is you're opening up their capacity to breathe. If you're opening up their capacity to breathe, you're opening up their whole mind-body connection and and you can start doing that primal pounding business. <laughs> you so know? you don't need Aaron's training of the body to be able no. to give a good breast massage, but if you could throw in a little intercostal release, like no Get one's complaining. There. Yeah. You know, a little MFR, <laughs> little intercostals. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? 
the doing breast massage. Actually, it's like something that most men never think of, and it's so exceptional. I'm finishing off this. You should probably put water in that. No, I don't give a shit. (laughs) I've had an erection for the last 35 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) So what you need is more fuel on the fire. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I am ready. As soon as you said primal pound, all engines on. That's all I need. I'm very oral. (laughs) Speaking of, all right, so after the most amazing breast massage, definitely going down on her. Aha. Yes. Okay. But here's one of the big keys. You have to know her. So some women, if they climax too quickly, Mm, they're actually going to be far less receptive to penetration. It's going to feel less amazing. So one of the keys sometimes to having a more incredible cervical orgasm is if you haven't had a climax. So actually doing teasing oral sex, like if she's available to it and you could tell her, you're like, hey, I'm not going to push you all the way to orgasm yet. I'm really going to make you wait. And like, I'm super excited to tease you with my tongue right now and to let you breathe into it and feel more pleasure build up in your body than maybe you have in a little while. Mm -hmm. Like you actually want to like guide her into what you're doing. So she's not like, wait, what the fuck? Why are you stopping? Or Mm -hmm. like, why are you like, why are you not bringing me to orgasm? So actually like teasing and titillating her body and encouraging her to breathe and giving periods of just like rest. So what this does is it actually stretches the nervous system's capacity to feel more and more pleasure. The more pleasure she builds up in her body, the more outrageous the orgasmic experience can become. Also, the better that a good pounding feels, Mm. right? Like if, if you think of like, Pussy not being turned on, being like literally contracted, uh, like not activating like deeper sexuality, like pounding is going to feel uncomfortable. It's literally when you're open that it feels so good. You could think of it like a back massage, right? If you have crazy tension and crazy knots and someone just goes in there right away, it's going to be like, oh my God, what the fuck are you doing? That's painful. You have to actually like, like relax it, open it up let it relax and then really deep strokes feel amazing. Yep. So what's happening is most women are receiving uh, pe- penetration far before their bodies are super craving it. Like if she's not begging you to come inside of her, you're not going to have the best primal pounding of your life. Like you should really tease her to the point where she's like, if you don't put your fucking cock inside of me right now, I will die. Right. And most men are not thinking of sex that way. They're thinking of like, how op- like how, like can I get it to a certain degree where she's like open enough that I can get inside of her versus like what would it feel like to have her begging? Mm. So mind shift is mm. very very important. The so the age old debate I've had a lot of sex folks on here and many of, <laughs> many of, many a folk suggests that there is no such thing as a cervical orgasm. It's all it's all clitoral. Not that it really matters. I think, but do you have any perception or experience of the difference between uh, orgasm being exclusively uh, from stimulation of the of the clit, which the clit's like a big old structure. It's not just the glands, little like the the, the front thing that you see, the, the clit that we think of. It wraps around the side and it goes in the back, and it's like a whole situation. Yes. Um, is there such a thing as a cervical orgasm? Is there such a thing? Is there a, is there a variance? Is there a difference between those two things? Yeah. Is what like what's what's the the heuristics on this? What's like the the the, the difference? What, do we, what what can we learn about these two? types or how many types are there there's so many types oh my god i'm lost <laughs> i'm so confused we can make a whole encyclopedia of the different types yeah. of orgasms um okay. and then we can wrap up after this because okay. go. <laughs> we're also on uh step four though so we have to go like we, we should finish this step. i want you to go I'll, I'll keep talking for the rest of the day i'm here i'm, I'm well thank you for looking out for me being on time but yeah, yeah. If, even if i leave it trying to be your masculine like container <laughs> thank you so much yeah you just be juicy and chaotic and just like allow your wisdom to flow and i'll just keep on track of the time <laughs> so, <laughs> i'll keep tracking time <laughs> just keep tracking time drinking the sex magic I'll, talk about, I'll come back and talk about brain structures every now and again you just keep on fucking flowing <laughs> Yeah, there's no reason to keep this train on the tracks. Like, yeah, I'll do it. I got this. I'm here for you. 
All right. So the are, so obviously everyone knows what a clitoral orgasm is, mm. but the the reason physiologically why people argue that there is no cervical orgasm is because the legs of the clitoris, as you're alluding to, wrap around the inside of the vagina, right? And the vagina is is the canal um, from the pelvic floor up to the cervix. And uh, I get that argument, but those people have never fucked a woman who has cervical orgasms. So I'm just going to go ahead and say it mm. because when you experience them, they are categorically different. Mm. They feel different. Uh, the the internal sensation is different. Mm. And you can have them from, uh, uh, what's the right way to put static movement is not the right word. Like basically, I understand what they mean by like any kind of penetration that would get to the cervix would be activating the clitoral network that wraps right. around the vagina. However, one of the best ways to have a cervical orgasm is with a, a cock or a, a dildo pressed up against the cervix, totally still. And so this is such a beautiful way to make love with a partner. It's like he's all the way up inside, up against the cervix, totally still looking into your eyes. And you can have the most outrageous fucking orgasms from that. Also, the cervix is one of the great activators of female kundalini energy. So when you have a cervical orgasm, it's literally like kundalini energy like explodes from your cervix up through your spine the cervix also does have innervation from i mean i am not a like a full physiological expert but like we've looked at this and it's vagus nerve and also pelvic nerve so there are nerve endings in the area um, and there is obviously sensitivity in the cervix because you feel it like if you've ever been to the gynecologist like you, you can or like even discomfort right you get knocked in the cervix it's super uncomfortable during sex so there is exquisite sensitivity inside of the cervix just like if you were to touch your clitoris when you're not turned on, if you were to touch it intensely, it's kind of uncomfortable, right? And so you can shift from discomfort to outrageous pleasure based on how turned on you are. So when a woman is turned on all the way up and deep inside of her, the cervix flips from being uncomfortable because most women think of it as like, oh, it's uncomfortable when I get hit hard in it, either through pounding where I'm not a ready. primal pounding. A primal pounding. Yeah, it could be a little uh, much. <laughs> but when your cervix is like open and receptive, it's like the most exquisite fucking pleasure in the whole world. So I really wish people would stop telling women that cervical orgasms don't exist because not only do they exist, but it's like, it's such a deep and fucking exquisite and intimate form of sex to be able to orgasm from your cervix. And it's something that all women can train themselves to do. So I've literally trained like probably like thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands of women to have cervical orgasms and they would all self-report. It is categorically different in the way that it feels. How about butt stuff? What do you want to know? Is there like a separate um, realm of orgasm within the butt? Could we have like clitoral, yes. cervical, anal? Yeah, so there's a whole anal network um, that I feel runs. like we need to like have characteristics of these things. We need like little, we need to like anthropomorphize the different orgasms. We need emojis. We need archetypes, <laughs> orgasmic archetypes. Dude, that's going to be our, I think we're going to go into business together, the orgasmic <laughs> archetypes. We're I gonna... see this. I'm vis my kundalini is expressing a visual manifestation of the the orgasmic archetypes. <laughs> Layla Martin, Aaron Alexander. And we'll sell the onesies, right? They'll be like the Absolutely. anal orgasm onesie and the clitoral orgasm onesie oh, yeah. and the G-spot orgasm onesie, oh, yeah. the prostate orgasm um, onesie. I, I see it. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So butt stuff. What do okay. I need to know? What do we need to know? So yeah, that actually is important to know that there is a deep network of sensitive and erogenous nerves in men and women's and everybody's second only to the clit second only to the clit and actually there is some research that i've seen that in some women there's actually more innervation mm. in their anus like it's that sensitive how interesting yeah god would have wanted what's us to god, have anal god, sex what's god up to <laughs> up there in there over there right you know What's going on? Nature wanted us. <laughs> nature wanted us to know the joy of anal sex and How like interesting. it's fucking exquisite. And this is another thing too. Like most women have not actually been initiated into anal sex in a way that it feels good. Because like all parts of our sexual anatomy, if you 
go there and it's not ready, it's fucking painful. Cervix is painful. Um, fucking vaginal opening, pelvic floor is painful. Anus is painful. If you've experienced pain during sex, it's because your body has not been open and receptive. Your body is tightening and saying no. Anything that's hard and tight, you know this in your body work, is painful, mm -hmm. right? And we get hard and tight or from- numb resistance or numb, yeah. right? And so in that, a lot of women are like, oh, like if you've had someone try and put anything inside your butt when you're not ready, it's horrible. It's also super vulnerable. Like mm -hmm. I think it was like Aubrey who was like, every straight dude should go to a gay male club to like feel what it's like to get hit on in a certain way. Mm, I, I, I thought you were gonna say primarily pounded. Ah! Well, I would love that. But I do think every straight man if you're not into butt play, which I highly recommend it, it's incredible, um, but you should explore having your anus penetrated, even if just with a toy or a finger or think about it. Think about the level of vulnerability that shows up in your body around that. Oh, yeah. And just know what a woman goes through every time. Yeah. It's your, like your, your dirty, gross, shameful, like, oh, no, what would you think of me if you, you know, and saw that or smelled something or whatever? It's like, oh. Yeah, and lot. beyond that too, like, can you imagine the like actual physiological vulnerability of getting fucked in the anus? Mm. Like, regardless of whether you desire it or not, what that would feel like to your body. Yeah. If you think about that for a woman, you will approach her body differently. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. Like how actually like sensitive and vulnerable that really is. Yeah. yeah. If you want to learn to be a good pitcher, you should experiment with being a catcher every now and again. Every now and again, you know? You know? <laughs> And so like with anal massage, with actually like like being so fucking turned on, anal sex can be super unpainful, unpainful, you know what I mean? And like like just like, like such a huge fuck yes. And like anal orgasms are incredible. They're like so central, so mind blowing, so erotic. And like anal sex too can be like raw and primal, but it can also be like so fucking intimate. It can be like one of the deepest intimate experiences. And so I like people to also understand that it can be on the spectrum. Like it can have that like dirty fucking like raw feel to it. It can also have the like, I'm so fucking in love with you that I wanna be in like every hole in your body. Mm. Step four. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping us on test. <laughs> so step four was good down on her. <laughs> step five. <laughs> we'll keep going until there are no more steps. <laughs> so usually like the pelvic floor and the vagina will soften open when something is smaller at first. So it can be really nice when you're going down on her to put like one or two fingers right up to the entrance of a vagina and just do like super slow penetration like very slow like every millimeter counts mm. and then like really slow penetration in and out with your fingers this thing not working in every woman fucking hates that mm. unless you're so turned on oh, it's yeah. like don't fucking do that to me so like like going so slow but penetration feels really good but it's all about slow it's all about like really like oh um, like instead of pushing her you want her to beg Mm. Right. Instead of trying to make her do something, you'd rather her be so open that she can't stand it if you don't. Mm. Right. And so that kind of switch in thinking and like some like it, it's like, again, I want to say you don't have to have sex like this all the time. Right. Like you can mix it up. But most people are missing this aspect mm. of sex. Probably the more a person is in, in their own body, the more they're going to be able to tap into the sensations and experiences and attune to what's happening within another body. And by probably I mean 100 percent. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you're in your mind and you're following, OK, cool, I listen to Layla, she did a step one, step two, step three. Um, you might actually be missing the experience of this amazing magical human being that's that you're you're sharing space with right now. Yes. So probably like step ultimo would be like <laughs> connect within yourself, connect within that person, and like deeply listen and to be able to tune into whatever it is that you're doing, being able to tap into like how are they breathing, how do they make any sounds, and that's something that I, I would I would I would hope from a female perspective and a male perspective, like opening up communication. And it doesn't even necessarily need to be words. It could be words, but like, give me something. Yeah, you totally. Know, if you don't like something, maybe go silent. Yeah. You know, if you really like something, like, let's get a little like a round of applause here. Yeah. You know, like. <laughs> and also, like, I will say for people who are brand new to this, it would be totally okay to ask your lover if you could do the five steps mm -hmm. and have some grace to learn it, right? Yeah. 
like to be like, look, I got to try this first. I'm not going to be like a master right away. Mm -hmm. Can I try this and you give me your feedback? Yeah. Right. Because it can be hard for some of us to go from like, oh, shit, I never thought of that before to like, like, I'm going to open your anus like a pro. You yeah. know? Well, this, but yeah, the, the, the steps sound super appropriate, more just like particularly like with cunnilingus or fellatio or whatever, yeah. when you're like in there yes. and you don't know, <laughs> you don't know, you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like the only way to know is for communication and you can communicate like somatically yes. through doing things with your hips and rubbing yourself and making yes. sounds or breathing Yes, or you can use words, but just like open up communication. Absolutely. Because they don't know. Yes. Yes. And exactly as you're saying, like the pro move is to then start following the body. Like yep. if her hips start moving, her breath deepens, there's little bits of sound, like all of that is like, keep going. Mm. The other big thing, I mean, you might, we've probably covered this before, but like such a huge tip for men is like, do the same thing with a woman longer than you think you should. Mm. Like one of the big ways that like men kind of fuck it up is by being like, oh, she loves this. Let me try something else. Or like, let me like switch it up this way. Right. And like in some ways, like men can be real novelty seekers with sexuality. Mm. And like the female body often is like, if I love it, don't fucking stop. Mm. Like that's a real female thing to say, right? Like, like don't me, like, stop. Let me listen to this song. Yes. Like I'm getting into this song. Like, let me just like, okay, cool. Like run that. Like, okay, I'm going to be with this for a little bit. Yes. How, what's, if the, if there was some periodization of clitoral strokes, how, what would be like ideal if you're writing a textbook, 45 seconds, two minutes, obviously it com is completely variable dependent upon the individual. Yes. But how long do you think is like an appropriate time as a general guide for, I mean, for a fella that's confused and lost and like, okay, I'm going to do, I, I got this stroke. 30 seconds, minute, five minutes. I had never been timing, so. <laughs> yeah, disregard that question. That was a stupid question. No, that was a very masculine question. I know. You like set the iPhone timer for like two minutes and do yeah, not a little, switch direction, bro. A little ding. <laughs> Disregard. I would, I would guess two to five minutes. Like oh that's, wow, that's, that would be my intuitive guess. That's your intuitive guess. Yeah, two to five minutes. Right? Yeah, even yeah. like clit, you know, oming. Mm. Like also, right? also, it's it, fifteen minutes. It seems like less is more. Yes, but like the clit is so damn sensitive. Yes, like you don't need to be like oh, you know, like having some type of satanic exorcism with the clit. No, and <laughs> here's the thing, like. <laughs> Think about if anybody does something really sudden to you and how you like will like like freeze up, right? Yeah, yeah. The moment that you've frozen up, it's very hard to relax back opening it. Mm. But if someone comes at you very slowly, you like relax into it, open up, open up, open up. So this is what you really want to think about. If you go too hard too fast, bodies will close. Mm -hmm. That's what they do naturally. So the vast majority of women have gotten used to over time. And I fucking hate that this is what's happening too hard, too fast. Even with your tongue, when you're going down on her, mm -hmm. even with your fingers, when you're like, like pushing so hard, even with your cock, if you go in too hard and too fast and what our bodies do is they constrict. And over time, as you're saying, we either then start feeling sexual pain or we go numb. So that's the other thing, because you can have a woman who's like pretty numb and she's just like like faster, 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 but mm -hmm. you can tell if she's really feeling it or if the faster is like, I don't feel anything, mm -hmm. so I need you to just fucking stimulate me. Yeah. Once she's like really opened, right? And that's like step six would be like, if you're going down on her, fingering her, finger banging her, all the like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> needs to be a better word for it. Yeah, it's not the best word. <laughs> I like it for some reason. It's surprising. It's jarring when you say it. <laughs> you know? Slow finger, finger banging. Bang. Slow connected finger banging where yeah. you're not changing uh, the process too much. And that's like a really good moment for like the G spot, like curling your fingers in. You can also actually give her cervical activation. So if she has an activated cervix, you can be like penetrating her with your fingers as you're going down on her or stroking her clitoris and like, like holding your fingers at the cervix. And if she's energetically sensitive, if you pulsate energy from your fingers into her cervix, this is one of the ways that you can convince yourself that energy exists. Mm. Because you will feel her respond if she's energetic, if she feels energy and she's energetically sensitive. Mm. So then from there, I highly recommend more making out because it's always like you've been like going down, you've been fingering her. There's like a kind of like slight emotional disconnection. So you redo the emotional disconnection and then penetration. So step seven, eight, nine, whatever the, the steps are on now, it's like, like literally like making that a moment 
which a lot of guys don't do. Not like some stupid, obviously I'm not saying like a cheesy moment and like whatever, like boys the men has to play on the the sound system. But like, it's like, uh, it's like actually, again, go slower than you think. Like, I can't tell you, like as a woman, it's like, wow, you get all that buildup. You're so excited. Like the moment of penetration feels so fucking good. And it's just like, bang, you're like, Again, like that's not the way to open her into the deepest feeling. If you start with slow penetration and give her energy time to build up and activate. So we're talking slow penetration, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, slow fucking kissing her, looking into her eyes. You will feel her body open more and more and more and more. And again, you want to get to the point where she's like, now I want to be primally fucked. Like mm. now I want to get like, like fucking bang my brains out. Women will get there. If they're not getting there, like, yes, you can work with them. Like maybe she's been hurt. Maybe there's trauma. Maybe there's all this. But a lot of the time you haven't connected with her deeply enough, gone slow enough and stayed with certain movements long enough to really build that full activation mm. of opening and surrender into her system. Because once you get surrendered, then it's like, fuck me to the high heavens. Mm. And it's be t probably tough to surrender if, if you feel like there's like a predatorial chase where I'm like in a rush and I'm like, oh, I need to get this. Yes. You know, there's something, there's something magnetic about the confidence of like, I don't need to get anywhere. Yeah. Exactly. You know, like we can, like, I, I like being here. Like, like I'm, uh, there's no particular rush. And then that opens up the other partner, you know, whatever man, woman, whatever it is, um, to want to come towards you. Yes. You know, so as opposed to having to shrink up and having to oscillate back and forth, okay, like try to unshrink, try to uncontract okay, back into that. What if we just open it up and kind of keep that, the distance just enough where it's like, oh no, like more, more, open more, open more, open more. And then perhaps you could, you know. Yes. And again, it's like, it's not like you don't have quickies. Like quickies are fucking amazing. Yeah. But there, you, everyone knows that a quickie is never the best sex of your life. You know, mm -hmm. like there's, there's this, this value to figuring out how to have her open so deeply because that moment where she is craving primal pounding, that will be one of the best sexual moments of her life. Mm. What a great time. You know? <laughs> well, I feel like that was a pretty full experience. I feel like we covered the basics. We did some orgasmic breath work in the beginning that may or may not be involved in some of the some of the, the conversation. <laughs> I uh, we tried some of the what is that what is this this stuff called mood or oh, what's the what's the the company called? Mood is the company. Mm, we had some ecstasy. We had some ecstasy, which you can take daily, Great. and we took sex magic, which you can take before podcasts or twenty mm. to thirty minutes before. I felt sex. really good after taking it. Right. I felt a little eye twitchy, which I think is a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you also took a lot. <laughs> I like that. I like a good eye twitch. If I, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm like, this shit's working. <laughs> Mood sexy supplements for the man who wants to fuck with an eye twitch. Yeah, exactly. No, really, I felt really good after taking it. It's nice and it tastes delicious. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. And I think there's probably some value as well in like the placebo of be like oh like i actually i take supplements for my gallbladder or my thyroid or whatever like what about taking some supplement even if the supplement was just whatever it was just an invisible thing that you reached out for and just like put in your mouth once a day you're like oh yeah like this is my like my like sex and libido and eroticism and like let's just invoke that within our day the same way that we pay attention to our muscles totally and people still associate doing anything with your sexuality that something is wrong mm -hmm. but like we've broken out of that in health like yeah. it's you don't take supplements because something's wrong with your health yeah. to make you healthier you take supplements because you fucking care about your health it's the same thing with sexuality yeah. like you can actually take supplements to optimize your sexual experience and do it because you care about it rather than because something's broken where would if someone were to get one where they wanted to just like increase libido which which one would you would you go sex. with or is that a dumb question well sex magic okay. um so sex magic and the uh that increases libido and we're going to come out with a, a custom male line soon as well so depending on when people are watching this that's like just for men cool yeah sweet uh people can find you on where 
LaylaMartin.com is mm. the best place going and signing up uh, anywhere on my website to stay connected. Um, I send emails that are literally like, people say like email list. It sounds old school. My emails fucking crush. So it's like a mix of just like step by step training in Tantra, sacred sexuality, relational practices like you've gotten in this podcast. Um, and then just like fucking like like ripping my heart out. Like these are my like deep like stories of my life right now. So it's a really cool thing to be a part of if, if, if you want to be connected and a really great way to get tantric education. You can also find me on YouTube, Instagram, all the things. Mm, amazing. Oh, and actually, oh, so we're doing this so here because, we go. because I'm releasing a new podcast called This Tantric Life by Layla Martin. So oh, please cool. also listen to my podcast. When you, when's it launch? It's launching in mid-April. Yeah, very exciting. Yeah. Um, well, I've had a massive pleasure and joy getting to know you over the years. And uh, I, really, I really feel like I see you and I really value what I see and I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Aaron. I feel like we've grown so much. It's crazy, huh? And like from knowing you, I mean, it must have been like eight years ago when I first met you. Probably so, yeah. And like I could not have wanted more for you. Like the man that you have become, like who you are now, how you are, it's fucking so inspiring. Hmm. It's it's like it's beyond beautiful. So um, oh, wow. fuck yes, whatever you've been doing. <laughs> I think it's probably the the mood, the mood ecstasy supplements. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm just high on my own fucking supplements. And like, hey, you just put anyone in front of me. Yeah. I'd be like, the last eight years have been amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like, bitch, I just met you. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, that is it. That is all. Thank you, Layla Martin. Thank you all for tuning in. I'll see you next week. Bye. Hope you guys devour that conversation. I want to invite you to the Align Podcast YouTube channel. Subscribe over there to get each week's instructional videos. We also share short clips from the podcast and things that I particularly thought were worth sharing. So check out the YouTube channel and remember to subscribe so you get each week's videos. If you want to share any clips from this episode on Instagram, you tag me at Align Podcast. You tag Layla at Layla Martin. Appreciate you. Hope you have a beautiful rest of your week. And I'll see you soon.